Yo, 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 what's up all you burner stoners and potheads? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How are all you v -v 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 vipers doing out there, Mrs. Weedman? Mr. Weedman. How the hell are you? Doing great. Yeah? Yeah. Great. Hopefully everybody out there smoking some big fat doinks while they're listening to the show. We're about to get normal. And we're smoking some GG4 grown by our friend Big Earl. I still got a lot of this because I'm a pig when it comes to good weed. <laughs> <laughs> you hoard your good I, stuff. I hoarded this strain. I didn't oh, yeah. give much of this out. <laughs> Sorry, everybody yeah, who I shared comes this by, with. We're like going to have a, a joint. I'm like, hey, Mr. Weedman, what can we grab out of the, not the GG4? Anything but the GG4. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pig when it comes to really good weed. I'm sorry. That's okay. You share a lot of weed. So <laughs> yes, we do. You're, you can save the good stuff. <laughs> this one is especially good. So, hey, uh, we're going to get baked. and uh, But while we're getting baked, we just start. There's nothing really new out right now. We, we burn through and zip through everything we watch. So we're watching some stuff that's been uh, on our list. I actually found a show that we had, I had heard of but never watched. Suits. It's pretty suits. good. It's, it's pretty enjoyable. good. And I'm not a suit wearing person or a suit fan, but this what is What year actually, is it from? Uh, like it's in eight seasons. So Ish. 2015, 2014, probably. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't really look when it started. I just saw <laughs> eight seasons. So, But we're still on season one. And I, I have to say it's a really good show. We're still on season one. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's oh, a, that's going to We got some watching. Yeah, we do. got some watching to do. But we're burning through an that's episode fun. a night. It's so. an easy watch. Yeah, it's funny. We got Grandma... Weed, who actually I renamed Ma 420. Oh, jeez. Ma 420. Oh, because you found out that Ma means weed. In Chinese, Mandarin. All so right. that's fair. Ma 420, because I call her Ma. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's kind of funny. So Grandma Weed <laughs> or Ma 420. <laughs> we have a lot of nicknames in this house. Yeah, I but, don't have one. Uh, no, actually, you don't. I don't. <laughs> Mrs. Weedman. I've never been a nickname. Mrs. Person. Weed Man. But <laughs> no, I actually like suits. It's that. actually really good. And we got Grandma or Ma Weed hooked on it now. She texted us the other day. She went home on Saturday and she texted us Sunday going, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm hooked. <laughs> I cannot stand Lewis. Yeah. He drives me nuts, but I love Harvey. Yep. I like Harvey. Can't I stand Harvey. Can't stand Lewis, but I really like Mike. Yeah. He's my fave. He's good. He's good. I like him a lot. And uh, I was the first sh time I've ever seen Ma uh, Megan Merkel, Markle, Mar Markle, Merkel, Markle. The um, yes, yeah, it's the first time I've ever princess. seen her in any show. I uh, no, they got ousted. Remember, yeah, right. <laughs> so she's not a princess. <laughs> but first time I ever saw, she's a pretty good actress, I guess. You know, it's first season. Decent, yeah. yeah. So, but I like the show. It's really good. So you haven't watched it? Check it out. Uh, what else we were going to talk about? We were going to talk about. Someone had given us a pre-roll in a tube from a dispensary. Two. Yeah, we got, yeah. And crazy. Mr. Weedman comes running out of the basement. And he's like, this answers everything. Because we had smoked it on the patio last fr Friday night. We had some friends over. Grandma Weed was still in town. Uh, shoddy and what do you call our son? Polly. <laughs> I just call him Paul. Polly were here. So anyway, we were hanging in the backyard on the patio, smoking, playing some games. And we all passed this joint around, smoking, smoking, got a nice head high. But it was not like a real pleasant high. And that could that could happen with any strain. Right. right? That it, Sometimes it's just the strain. But in this case, we concluded, Mr. Weedman then came upstairs and said, this is this explains it. The tube had, you know, the pick date. The roll date, the testing date, da da da. This weed was like two years old. Two years old. Being sold in a dispensary. Two years old. Like the pick date was two years different than the like the roll date. And we didn't get it from a dispensary. And the roll date was from a very recent date. Yeah. So this is sitting for two years. Well, why? Yeah. You know? Why? Someone someone gave it to us at a at a, an event and it, it was I had gotten a really bad headache that night. Yeah, we all had, everyone complained about a headache. Yeah. Everybody was a little edgy. Like it wasn't, uh, it just wasn't good. It was a very, it was an infused pre roll. Yeah. And I, at first and foremost, infused pre rolls are fine. I like them. I don't smoke them that much though. Uh, especially when they're, when, when I just, I don't know, 
they just make me really, really heady when I smoke them. But this one gave me a terrible, terrible headache, and I never mm-hmm. get a headache from smoking weed. I had a headache the next morning. That too. I drank la- one glass of one glass of like a really light summer rose. It was not a heavy wine. I had eaten all day. I wouldn't get a headache from one glass no. of wine. I think we like had a weed hangover from that. I don't even think it was a weed hangover. Not even, I don't even know if that's possible. It was but just, we just had a headache. I, it was just brutal. Wasn't good. It was brutal. And you, you were 100 percent right. The high from this was just like evil. Yeah, it just wasn't nice. It not, just put like a bad bad I mean nobody was bickering or not getting along or anything. Nothing obvious happened. But when you look back on the night, it's like I totally was in a perfectly fine mood. Why did I feel like really in my head? Yeah. I don't know. I don't and, know what and a headache. It just I don't was know not what, nice. What the infu- it was infused with distillate and keef and flour. And it was just didn't taste good, first and foremost. It didn't have a good clean smoke, and it made perfect sense when I went and looked the strain. When I went and looked at the uh, the tube, I was like, "This makes sense." Yeah, because it wasn't a strain that should have given us that effect no, either. Not at it all. It was an uppity strain. We should have been totally fine, happy, having a good time, and here we were all. It like made me very quiet, slumpy. and yeah. it made me very slurry, and I didn't like the way I felt. Yeah. And so check your dates. Yes. Like I would say, even when you're at the dispensary, if if they won't let you hold your product, because I know a lot of dispensaries won't let you hold the product until you pay for it. You don't get the bag until it's all the transaction is over. But you could ask them, hey, look at the dates on that. Can you just tell even if it's distal, it's even if it's a vape, just I mean, vapes are a little different because it, it got but, a year. But really, I mean, check your dates yes. on all. Just like I mean, you do at ask the, the ask store. the bud tenders when before they ring you out, they ring it up, going, "Hey, can you at least read me the information on there? Can you read me the dates? When yeah. was the pick date? When was the curing date? When was the packaging date? I think that was the three things that were on there. And let me know what it says. Yeah. You know, I mean, basically, it's, this was twelve of twenty one, right? Twelve of twenty one, and it was packaged in like a couple months ago. Yeah. Package. Yep. It had a very recent packaging date. Yep. Crazy. Yeah. So very just weird. Check your dates. Check your dates, everybody. And I will That's not be. Sm- I will, I, I, and usually I give stuff away if I don't like it or I give it to like family and friends. This will be going in the garbage. Yeah. Straight up in the garbage. Nobody I'm not mentioning the name of the company. I'm not mentioning who gave it to me out of respect uh, for the industry in general. But just be careful and look at dates. Yep. And please, if you're handing stuff out, Look at the dates. And you're a vendor <laughs> and you're handing stuff out. Make sure, because in Illinois, you have to go to the dispensary to pick up your samples. Right. So you should be looking at your own quality control when you're handing this stuff out, too. So, Well, and the person on, on their behalf, I mean, it was just packaged a couple months ago. Right. It was, but still look at the but dates. Look at the date. <laughs> before look at the date. You, it before was you hand, especially if you're a vendor handing the stuff out, that's your product. Yeah. I mean, that's literally your product. That's, that's promotion. Your, that you're yeah. you're repping that brand. You need to make sure you need to handle it up. Yeah. So check it out, everybody. Be careful out there. You ready to get the show started? I am ready. Let's do this. Live rosin is the premium pot extract worth the price. In the world of cannabis concentrates, live rosin has been having its moment in the sun. Potent, often amber-colored substances made without the use of solvents, aside from water, making it appealing for people seeking an all-natural craft experience. Offering out-of-this-world taste, the creamy extract is gaining market share at rapid pace. Based on same-store sales across the U.S., a seen 61% rise in rosin sales since 2021. Uh, a cannabis point of, uh, this p- cannabis point of sale company called uh, Cova Software was keeping is keeping track of this one. It seems that as certain cannabis consumers have been exposed to this category of product, they've developed a preference and have been shifting their purchases. With more cannabis users seeking out live rosin, despite its premium price point, many wonder is it actually worth it. To create an, uh, any type of concentrate, active ingredients must be removed from the cannabis flower. This includes cannabinoids like THC and CBD, as well as flavor forward terpenes. The main differentiator between live rosin and other concentrates lies in the extraction process. Many of the concentrates on the market are butane hash oils, BHO, uh, to make these dabs. The plant matter is stripped using butane. The solvent is then removed, leaving behind a viscous oil. 
Rosin is created by applying heat and extreme pressure to cannabis flower or trim. The cannabinoids and terpenes are literally squeezed out, resulting in thick yellow oil. People who prefer to consume live rosin often use lower temperature on their dab rigs to preserve the unique flavor. Live defined. The live and live rosin refers to using freshly frozen cannabis plants as a source material. If the word live isn't present, it means that cured buds were used instead. Many people confuse live resin and live rosin. The word resin on a dispensary menu or package means that the oil was made using a solvent-based extraction method. Rosin only uses water or heat and pressure, no chemical solvents. But don't forget, water is a solvent, too. Mm, yeah, but <laughs> completely somewhat. natural. Yes. Um, hash rosins versus flower rosins. There are actually two types of rosins. One is often made from flour, while the other is made from bubble hash. Flour hash sees buds squished in special rosin press. It can also be made at home using a hair straightener and parchment paper. We've talked about that before. Hash rosins adds an extra step to the process. Prior to pressing, the cannabis flower is washed in ice water bath. Then gently rem uh, this gently removes the trichomes, which are crystals containing the majority of cannabinoids and terpenes. Because of the cool temperature, the bulbous trichome heads freeze and stay intact. A series of screens separate the trichomes from the plant, resulting in something called bubble hash. Rosin can then be created by pressing the hash. Most cannabis connoisseurs prefer hash rosin since it typically contains less plant matter. It also tends to be more potent and contains far more terpenes than flower rosin, resulting in a tastier dab experience, which we have been enjoying the last couple of weeks. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Is rosin really better? Because rosin is more expensive to manufacture at scale, these costs are passed along at retail level. A gram of BHO in California can cost as little as $15. They're saying uh, this, they're using a word, designer rosin, on the other hand, may run close to 80 plus tax. I don't know if you need to use designer. <laughs> Just call it rosin. Many people believe that rosin is off uh, is is of higher quality in BHO. They may also think it's safer to consume because it's solventless. However, before these theories can be debunked, both of these theories can be debunked. Dr. John McKay, a cannabis extraction expert and educator, says that flower use is a better indicator of quality than the extraction method itself. All extraction processes are inherently dependent upon the type of condition of the starting material, Dr. McKay told Green State, who wrote this article. For example, if buds have mold on them prior to being put in a rosin machine, it may end up in the final product. This risk is virtually eliminated in the BHO process since the solvents remediations remove any pathogens that may be present. I still think it's kind of gross. <laughs> Uh, as with any technique, the person who's using the technology also has to be aware of whether they are cutting corners based on doing things that are not as uh, that are not as scientific. For example, making sure the material is clean before they press. Dr. McKay explained, the regulations around the production of BHO means that any residual butane must be removed. And this is the reason why I always say, I don't, I don't. The only reason why I don't like BHO is because I always taste the butane. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the quality of the bud they're using is wrong or anything like that. I just taste the chemical. Oh, my God. It's awful. Um, we had gotten some hash from somebody, and it tasted I, – I, I, as soon as I smoked it, I was like, this, I can't smoke this. I just it, – I'm eating it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the regulations around the production of BHO means that any residual butane must be removed, making it fit for human consumption. The idea that rosin is sol solventless can come into question since technically water is the universal solvent. And we talked about that a, mo a few moments ago. Uh, it can also be argued that since solvent based extraction is done at a colder temperature, it preserves more of the potency overall. Anytime heat is applied to cannabis, it may de uh, decarboxylate. This can change the overall chemical composition and could result in the less stellar effects. Live rosin, a craft product at a premium price. Considered to be one of the most highly quali high quality cannabis products on the market, live rosin gains popularity every year. Despite its hefty price tag, many consumers are drawn toward the concentrate. 
While there's precipitation that rosin is safer and more natural alternative to BHO, this may not always be the case. When done correctly, BHO can be uh, can be just as dank as rosin in many ways, and perhaps even cleaner than some rosin. Either way, the live rosin versus BHO debate continues to rage throughout the uh, community. There are plenty of opinions on both sides of the rig, but if sales are any indicator, rosin is clearly making major waves. And I'm sorry, everybody, Yuki got a new toy, and she usually hangs out down here but bec- without toys, but she brought her new toy down here, and that's what you hear the squeaking. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Weedman is going to go, and I'm going to make Yuki very mad at me because I'm going to take her toy away. So uh, <laughs> cannabis use during office hours. What are they saying it's not associated with, Mrs. Weed Mayan? It is not associated with an elevated risk of workplace accidents. This is a new study. Employees who consume cannabis during their off hours possess no greater risk of occupational injury than do those who abstain from weed altogether, according to data published this week in the Canadian Journal of Public Health. Researchers affiliated with the University of Toronto, Dalalana School of Public Health, assess the relationship between cannabis use and workplace accident risk in a cohort of 2,745 Canadians, authors determined. In this longitudinal study, we evaluated the relationship between past year cannabis use and the risk of workplace injury, differentiating workers who used cannabis before or at work from those using outside of work only. While no statistically elevated relationship existed between non-workplace use and workplace injury, workplace use was associated with an almost twofold increase in the risk of workplace injury. They concluded, study results bring greater clarity to the question of whether cannabis use increases the risk of experiencing a workplace injury, an issue that the conflicting findings of previous studies have hampered. Findings suggest that thinking about the potential occupational safety impact of a worker's cannabis use, it is important to consider when the use is taking place. More specifically, only use in the close temporal proximity to work appears to be a risk factor for workplace injuries, not use away from work. Conventional drug testing for cannabis identifies the presence of either THC or its primary metabolite, carboxy-THC. In more habitual consumers, THC may be present in blood for several days post-abstinence. Carboxy-THC may be detectable in urine for several weeks or even months after past exposure. A positive test result for either substance cannot determine whether one has recently consumed cannabis or whether they are even under the influence. Normal has advised against the use of pre-employment and employment drug detection tests and has instead called for greater use of performance testing technology, such as DRUD, which is driving under the influence of drugs, risk assessment, uh, and another one called alert meter. Normal's deputy director, Paul Armentano, said, Requiring would-be hires and employees to undergo urine screens for past cannabis exposure is invasive and ineffective. They neither identify workers who may be under the influence nor contribute to a work envi- a safe work environment. Those who consume alcohol legally and responsibly while away from their jobs aren't punished by their employers unless their work performance is adversely impacted. Those who legally consume cannabis should be held to a similar standard. Yes. Last month, Michigan regulators moved to abolish pre-employment cannabis screens for most public employees. Lawmakers in Nevada and Washington have recently adopted similar bans. Additionally, the District of Columbia, plus California, Connecticut, Montana, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island have amended their laws so that many employees are no longer terminated from their jobs solely because of a positive drug test for THC metabolites. Progress. Progress. Little bits. Uh, Yuki's mad. Yeah, you took her toy away. Now she's marching I, around. I, I put it on the on the on the ledge, and she keeps on going by the couch and <laughs> wants to literally jump on the couch and on the ledge to get her her new toy. And I keep on shaking my hand, going, "No, no, 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 no." <laughs> After the show, <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna get it. Oh yeah, we've talked about cannabinoids. We've talked about terpity terp terp terpenes. We've talked about flavonoids. 
Now we're going to talk about esters. And I learned a little bit about, well, I should say I learned a lot about esters uh, in beer. So how these well-known brewing flavors are revolutionizing our understanding of cannabis. While most home brewers know about esters due to their role in creating flavors during yeast fermentation of alcohol, many cannabis consumers and businesses aren't very knowledgeable about the existing or exciting flavor and scent chemicals. Recent research has shown potentially notable medical effects, and one company even has the patent on some esters of THC. While the term esters was coined in 1848 by a German chemist, Leopold G Glemlin, likely as a contraction for estegather, which means aesthetic ether in German, their discovery goes back almost a century earlier to 1759. The Count Dracula, oh sorry, Count of Lagardius, performed the first synthesis of the ester ethyl acetate. Making one of the fir making it one of the first, if not the first, example of an ester being synthesized. Esters are derivatives of a carboxylic acid in which the hydrogen atom of the hydroxyl group has been replaced with the alcohol group, alkyl group, and then their structure in the product of alcohol combined with carbolytic acid. The role of esters in flavor and scent. Like terpenes, esters are very common in plants and are the cause of many of the odors and flavors of the plant we smell and food we eat. For example, wintergreen gets its odor and flavor from the esters methyl salicylic eight, and pears smell and taste like they do because of the propyl esonate. Man, words are hard sometimes. Uh, similarly, some of the flavors and scents of cannabis are results of esters. Esters versus phenols or phenols. Both esters and phenols are responsible for flavor and scents, but different types of flavors and scents. In the context of beer brewing, ester flavors are seen as desirable good flavors, and phenol flavors are generally seen as undesirable or bad flavors, but it depends on the beer and the palate of the person drinking it. Broadly speaking, phenol flavors are usually earthier or smokier, but they can also be clove-like. What do esters... Uh, what do esters and cannabis do? Before he passed away, the father of cannabis research, Raphael Michelum, was very involved in researching esters and cannabis. Specifically, Michelum was looking at cannabidolic acid methyl esters, which is a can cannabidolic acid that has gone through a process of esterification. As his research demonstrated, esters are responsible for more than just flavor and have medical benefits. Michelum's team found that can cannabidolic acid methyl ester is a potential medicine for treating some nausea and anxiety disorders and possibly other disorders ameliorated by enhancements of 5-HT1A, receptor activation. A follow-up of the study was done by Michelum and his colleagues where they gave cannabidolic acid methyl esters to rats, not mice, strange, and found it might modulate the sleep-wake cycle by engaging the hypothalamus. Research by uh, Mohamed A. El Soli at NIDA's Cannabis Research Facility looking at cannabis, ma cannabis esters made from acidic cannabinoids and found that the CB run receptors assay indicated that the esters as well as the parent acids are not active. That means they did not have an impact at the CB1 receptor and thus should not produce feelings of intoxication or euphoria. El Soli's team also observed the 4 terpenol cannabinolate showed moderate antimicrobial activity against uh, Kennedy Albicene's ATCC 90210, sorry, wrong show, 90028. Aurora Cannabis actually has a patent on certain THC esters, but it's not clear if they are actively using the patent esters on any of their cannabis products. Their role in alcohol brewing, as esters are formed by reaction of organic acids and alcohols created during fermentation, they play a big role in the brewing of alcohol, especially how yeast impacts different flavors and scents to alcohol. 
While other flavors can be added to beer and other alcohol by adding fruit, spices, and other botanicals, the flavor from esters is from yeast fermentation and is influenced by three main factors. The characteristics of yeast, wort composition, which is the nutrients, which is almost like a brewed tea, and the conditions of fermentation or the environment. Some strains of yeast are known to produce higher levels of esters, such as the yeast used in Bavarian wheat beers, which often have high amounts of isomal acetate, a banana-like flavor. Wort comp comp composition can be simplified to the nutrients the yeast has access to the, and higher concentrations of sugar, zinc, and amino acids tend to lead to more esters. Other things like dissolved oxygen and lipid content can reduce the production of esters. The fermentation environment also plays a major role, and it seems the shallower, more open fermentation ve vessels lead to more esters. Esters aren't just a major feature in beer, but also spirits, most notably Jamaican rum. Oh, yummy, mm. yummy, yummy. Uh, Jamaican uh, has long... Uh, Jamaica has long been known for producing high ester rums, but in 1934, they passed the Rum Ether Control Act, which for the first time imposed the ester limit of for rum. Boo. For a limit of 1,600 GRHIAA of esters is still enforced to this day by Jamaica Spirits Pool Association. If anyone was concerned that the limit has to, to do with health and safety, it does not. It has to do with more of some quirks of the global alcohol market during the era of prohibition. Boo, man, stopping the gold coming out of esters, man, and Jamaican rum. Ooh, we do like Jamaican rum. Um, so, yes, esters play an important role in, in, in a lot of this, and I think we're going to understand more and more when, when it comes to cannabis and esters. So good, good article, High Times. Now, another good article by High Times. This is a little long one, but I, I saved it. Uh, it came back out in July, and I saved it because I knew it was long, and, and, and uh, this is, like, really, like, reform of weed and why the two-party system needs to go to f go to fuck off right mrs weed man yes tell us about it weed reform epitomizes why the two-party system needs to fuck off several topics unite americans but the government rarely takes action as the senate reportedly inches closer to a committee vote on safe banking I can't help but think about how great it would be if the two-party system system fucked right the hell off into a <laughs> bottomless hole. <laughs> All right, that might be harsh. Let me try this again. The two-party system is an oppressive form of government masquerading as more as a more open system than it actually is. And the appalling progress on cannabis is just one of numerous recent and historical examples of how bullshit it is. Many cannabis bills have been introduced or are currently up for congressional consideration, and safe banking represents one of the most discussed. In terms of U.S. bills progress, the movement has been rather substantial since its initial introduction in 2013, then known as Marijuana Business Access to Banking Act. But if we're waiting this long for common sense banking bills that may or may not finally include social justice parameters, how long will it take to pass more sweeping federal reforms? More importantly, how long should we rely on the left or the right to eventually pass legislation on issues Americans seem to overwhelmingly agree on? For too long, Americans have demanded change only to have lawmakers turn the other way. Democrats and Republicans have dominated the system for roughly 140 years and have their fair share of support. But when pragmatically looking at the people's will and the actions of the two parties over that time, it becomes rather clear that more options would satisfy most Americans. Can I say something real quick before yes. you go on? I'm just saying this. I don't care what anybody else thinks. It's my opinion that no one should be allowed in office over 65 years old. Yeah. And, we, and, and us as, as the population of this country should, should do that and vote on that and just nobody over 65. Just want to throw it out there. Go ahead, Ms. Weeman. Okay. <laughs> you can't rush legislation, but you can fast track it. Some even argue that's how the American government was intended to operate. But more often than not, it feels like a system full of obstructions and gridlock rather than conscious lawmaking. Slow moving legislation happens by design, even among the few subjects that, the un that unite Americans across party lines. In recent years, topics like substandard infrastructure, 
public safety, they have inched along when much of the public has called for a rapid response. Weed is another clear example. Until federal reform passes, cannabis remains a Schedule I narcotic, meaning people will continue to be policed and subjected to the penal system. And for businesses, they can't bank like other legal industries despite generating billions of dollars in sales. The lack of... Uh, blah, 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 blah. The <laughs> lack of substantial progress on cannabis exists despite years of growing support across the country. In 2022, roughly 88 percent of respondents supported legalization in some form. Now remember, these parties work for us. They are civil servants. They are. 88 percent want it legalized and 59 percent in favor of both recreational and medical the overwhelmingly positive numbers result from decades of largely upward momentum in America. Gallup reports that after starting at just a 12% approval rating in 1969, cannabis legalization had 68% of respondents supporting the measure by 21%. 68%. While conservatives have often lagged in support, their numbers have grown closer to liberals and independents more recently. The across-the-aisle support for legalization resembles other issues that have seen little progress in recent years. Still, the underlying takeaway is that people want upgrades in, to their roads, water systems, pollution management, etc., and the same goes for weed. Much like how safe banking intends to provide relief to businesses and possibly those with cannabis records, President Biden's bipartisan $1 trillion infrastructure bill could relieve national dissatisfaction with, le with legislators if it were to pass. And then there's guns. As controversial a topic as gun control can be, safety isn't. In 2022, after years of countless, countless acts of gun violence, Congress passed and President Biden signed the first reform bill in three decades. Polls showed support for the measure, though many expected it to do little to curtail gun violence. Whether it's infrastructure, guns, cannabis, or even health care, Congress tends to lag on issues that Americans largely agree upon. Rather than taking action on issues that unite the country, bills languish for years, often dying well before then. Safe banking is incrementally moving along, and signs indicate that Senate Majority Leader Schumer is supporting some justice reform measures this time. These modern concerns highlight one aspect of why the two-party system needs to fall. But why listen to some dude who smokes weed and gets limited engagement on social media? I'm certainly no expert. Instead, I'll defer to others who may be more informed on the subject. Like, perhaps, George Washington? <laughs> as he was departing his role as America's first president... Washington warned the populace about political parties, not just the two-party system, but parties in any form. Washington worried that the partisan fighting and the cunning ambitions of what he called unprincipled men would lead to the destruction of the government. But Washington's warning went unheeded. While parties today evoke a range of public sentiments, their rise in the early to mid-1800s served as the first chance most people were given to be part of government. Over time, however, complaints about the two parties have grown. By 1950, concerns focused on a lack of fair representation in politics. Proposed solutions included the full-scale dissolution of the Democratic and Republican parties, suggesting that anything short of total abolition of the parties would lead to tribalist voting. Various other ideas have been presented as possible solutions without the entire system disappearing. One option gaining system, I'm sorry, one option gaining steam is rank choice voting. Rather than voting for just one person, voters rank their picks in order of preference. If no candidate receives the majority of votes, the person with the least votes is eliminated. Anyone who voted the eliminated person as the top pick will have their second choice counted in the next count. The process keeps going until one candidate secures the majority vote. Seems very fair. Ranked choice is being adopted in numerous cities and state elections and in certain state party 
primaries. In 1996, independent businessman Ross Perot posed the best independent challenge, accumulating 19.7 million votes, nearly 19% of the total tally. In 2000, Ralph Nader garnered just roughly 2.8 million votes. Still, his campaign is credited with swaying the election to George Bush Jr. Similar claims were made in 2016 when Dr. Jill Stein and Gary Johnson's campaigns helped Donald Trump secure the election. Other than Perot, fringe third-party options have barely posed a threat. Instead, they represent a spoiler rather than a viable spoiler. spoiler. The lack of real potential to win leads many to not vote for their preferred third party option and choose one of the big two. That's right. Only in times of severe frustration do people turn to third party choices, often as a form of protest vote. Some say that's democracy. Others would laugh and say a true democracy needs three or four, three or more viable options. With more viable parties, Americans would have choices that accurately reflect their views. From religious to far right to far left to the center, smaller parties would speak to the cause of voters rather than one politician promising tons and delivering on little once elected. Supporters of the status quo often say this is a critical reason the two-party system works. The system supposedly limits the rise of radical parties while promoting stability via broad coalitions. While certainly possible, change could also improve the chance that parties actually work together. If they don't avoid gridlock, they face greater odds of being voted out. Rather than forcing all political ideologies into the only two viable groups for a chance to win, scholars and legal minds have continued the decades-old call for the end of the two-party system. The sentiment is shared across the aisle, including strict conservatives who call for abolishing primary elections and party references on ballots. In truth, it's the bastardization of free choice that allows two parties to sow dissent among the public while fending off actual political challenges. So what does this all have to do with weed, right? Yeah, You're tell me about asking. it. Tell well, me about it. I've been wondering the whole time. I know. <laughs> the two-party system has forced cannabis to play a game of incremental progress when time is not in its favor. Since the drug war began, time has never been in weed's favor. But now, as a legal billion-dollar industry matures and people remain in jail, cannabis reform must happen. Thousands are still in state and federal prisons for nonviolent cannabis charges. Until laws change, American adults continue to be at the whim of state and federal rules. While many states have reformed laws, numerous lag behind. In doing so, millions of Americans continue to be prevented from access to medicine or their adult right to consume a substance that presents little fear of addiction or grave harm. While banking pales compared to human rights, reform is also essential for businesses. You may not care if an MSO or a major brand struggles with banking, but let's not forget the many legacy operators who got licenses early on. Let's not overlook the shop owners giving back to their communities. They deserve common sense banking, even if some suited vultures will also benefit. Yes, the current iteration of safe banking is rumored to include some additional parameters, which may include record reform, like expungements for people previously convicted of a cannabis offense. That's great to hear, but we're still playing a dangerous game where expanding the bill's scope to drug war victims could upset Republican Congress members and upend the bill. And still, I find cannabis advocates celebrating this progress as if it's a mark of a significant change if the if passed, the bill will address banking and correct thousands of records, but it still falls short of legalizing the plant and freeing currently incarcerated individuals on the federal level. This is where dis, this is where detractors will say other bills are coming down the pipeline to address these matters, and others like the House's 2022 passage of a bill to remove cannabis from the 1970 Controlled Substance Act marks progress underway. We may even finally see rescheduling this year, which could be and would be amazing. This should have been done years ago, 
but two parties and stubborn views helped clog the system up. No doubt, we should celebrate the progress underway, but we shouldn't be celebrating, we should have been celebrating, sorry, years ago. I'm aware that dismantling two-party dominance is likely a pipe dream. It certainly won't happen tomorrow, but keep the idea in mind. Whether it be for pot reform or otherwise, the two-party system is choking out our options and limiting true representation in government. By having no real competition, the two parties can half-ass their way to the top and stay there as long as the voting public stays divided at, and at each other's throats. Cannabis represents the most diverse voting bloc in American history. We may not agree on everything, but it's safe to say that most of us feel that lawmakers across the aisle are failing us. Remember that sentiment when it's time to vote in local, state, and national elections. Or, at the very least, start pushing for rank choice voting so that more options can appear on your ballot. The future of cannabis and the country could benefit from it. We've talked about when cannabis doesn't go legal in a state and it's voted it's voted by it's not voted by the public right it's voted by the house or the senate and states and stuff and 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 you know it's up to us to vote them out and change what we don't like mm -hmm. you know so good article long really long but a lot of good points mm -hmm. so uh good good job reading that mrs wee man i'm gonna give you the bowl back because i know you need a little yeah. hit after that let's smoke some more there you Thanks. go you're welcome Illinois, the place where we live now for 25 years, <laughs> yeah. is one of the most expensive, well, me anyway, 25 years. You lived here for a lot longer than that. <laughs> it's one of the most expensive, least diverse cannabis markets in the U.S. Hmm. And, Doesn't surprise me. Well, and Pritzker keeps on touting how well – the Illinois and all the laws that he put into place and diversity and what they're doing. I mean, he's going uh, to talk, uh, uh, I think about it in a couple of weeks on stage about the cannabis market and how w well Illinois is better than any other market out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Missouri who cannot catch a break since they went legal, even though they're, they're, they're bringing in a lot of dollars, but they're very short on weed right now. Flour. And they just announced a recall for more than over a thousand products. And the two main ones are gummies and uh, cartridges. And uh, there are 1,056 items that were listed with the same license number. And I'm going to read it just because if you live in Missouri and you have this, you need to better not smoke it. MAN000022. According to the recall list from the DHSS, some of the products listed, like I said, are gummies and cartridges. Um, the Missouri Division of Cannabis Regulation issued a recall, uh, according to the press release from the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. According to the press release, products were not compliantly tracked in the statewide track and trace system metric to allow the DCR to verify the products came from uh marijuana grown in Missouri or or that the product pass required testing prior to being sold at dispensaries. So if you have that uh, license number on there, I would return it or don't use it. Um, Wyoming. We don't talk a lot about Wyoming when it comes to cannabis, but this is positive. Uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, the Cheyenne City Council. Cheyenne. Cheyenne, thank you. <laughs> voted sure. on their meeting this evening to adopt resolution supporting the decriminalization of, of marijuana in the state. The council voted five to two in favor of the re re resolution with council members, um, uh, two council members voting against it. With the adoption, the city uh, can present the resolution to the Wyoming Association of Municipalities to bring them in term conversations for the state legislator present to other municipalities to endorse their own resolution on the support and president of any state legislative for sponsorship, endorsement, and support the resolution states. Wyoming is one of four states alongside Idaho, Kansas, you're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy, and South Dakota, where both recreational and medicinal marijuana uses are illegal. It also belongs to the small majority of states that impose fines and jail time for residents who possess less than an ounce of marijuana. 
According to the 2020 Wyoming Survey Analysis Center conducted by the University of Wyoming, 54% of residents say they support allowing adults in Wyoming to legally possess cannabis for personal use. And 85% of the residents say they support the legalization of cannabis for medical purposes. Wow. So those four states around there, crazy. 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 New York's first uh, farmer's market, marijuana cannabis farmer's market, uh, opened last week. Pretty cool. I saw the video of it. It was really nice to see. And uh, more uh, municipalities and stuff are going to start doing this. I I guess it went really well. People were happy. There was a line. People were getting in. It was crappy weather, but still had a good showing. And I I, I like that. Uh, that people got to go to a farmer's market to buy weed because there's only 12 dispensaries in the state right now open. So, And there's such an influx, they're letting farmer's markets happen. Till some of them are going mm. all the way to December. That's pretty cool. Yeah, because there's such an abundance of flour that were grown. So, mm. Also, uh, New York City council members tout new law against unlicensed cannabis as a game changer. All those stores, those bodegas that were selling unli- unlicensed dispensaries that were just selling... There's 2,000 illegal cannabis shops, and there, there's a new law saying that if you're a landlord and you allow this to go on, you're going to get fined. So, hmm. uh, yeah, the city's coming down hard. Uh, so here, this this is a two-thing article. So uh, users of, of drugs, not only just cannabis, but drugs, uh, cannot be barred from owning guns, a U.S. court rules. And this was back in August, August 9th. A federal appeals court uh, last Wednesday ruled that decades of old law prohibiting users of illegal drugs from owning firearms was unconstitutional as applied to the case of a marijuana user that latest fallout from the U.S. Supreme Court ruling last year that expanded uh, gun rights. So this was uh, the New Orleans-based Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals uh, but so it, it, it's just crazy because they heard the case. They said it was unconstitutional, but now DOJ says federal appeals court incorrectly decided that gun ban for marijuana consumers is unconstitutional. The Justice Department has informed a federal appeals court that it believes a separate court's ruling in the marijuana and gun rights case was incorrectly decided and it seeks a favorable decision in the related lawsuit. In a one-page brief filed last Friday, the federal government notified judges on the U.S. Court of the Appeals for the 11th Circuit that the separate U.S. Court of Appeals for the 5th Circuit recently deemed the law barring cannabis consumers from buying or possessing firearms to be unconstitutional. The DOJ contested the decision in that case, which is also relevant to the lawsuit that the 11th Circuit Court is, is considering. The suit originally filed by former Florida Agricultural Commissioner Nikki Free, Democrat, more narrowly concerns the rights of the state registered medical cannabis patients to own guns, but the basic structure of the case is the same. So uh, this is going to go back and forth for a hot minute. Also, in the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas, a judge ruled that laws prohibiting the sale and transfer of guns to people who use marijuana is also unconstitutional. Despite the rulings, the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the ATF, has mandated that marijuana firearms ban is ambiguous and enforceable, including in states where marijuana has been legalized. Man, this is like going across craziness right now. There's a, so you can find this article also on Marijuana Moment. It's, it's really good if you want to read the whole thing, but it's you're going to see this go for a hot minute here. Um, University of Gonzaga is bringing the classroom to the cannabis industry starting this fall. Good for you, Gonzaga. Good basketball team. Going to start teaching people about cannabis. I love it. Uh, Alabama reduced medical uh, marijuana licensing, roll tide. Some original winners lose out, uh, and there's a list of people who got cultivation, but um, processors, integrity, but some of the big MSOs that tried to uh, go in there, uh, they ousted them. (laughs) So Alabama, making moves. Now just get flour on there so people can buy flour, please, and everything else. Not just suppositories. Fifty <laughs> percent of Americans have experienced cannabis, says Gallup poll. Have experienced cannabis. Fifty percent. Hmm. 
Uh, it's time for the cannabis industry or marijuana industry to focus on ag- advocacy and lobbying if it's going to thrive. And this is from Marijuana Moment. The cannabis industry is facing unprecedented challenges. People are losing money as they oversupply of product labor shortage, supply chain disruptions, and higher costs for key components like fertilizer, building materials, packaging, and forcing companies to streamline operations as much as possible. Meanwhile, crushing regulatory environments, tax structures far more costly than any other industry continue to make finding financial success in cannabis very difficult. It's time to push reforms. Form, they're saying, just like Mrs. Weedman talked in her article, uh, out of sight, out of mind. Most of the industry current cash flow problems are the result of federal prohibition, they're saying. Uh, they're saying that they need the Safe Banking Act. Choose ac- advocacy, not apathy. Business owners should, should budget for a worthwhile investment for advocacy work so they're not only survive but also have a chance to prosper. It's not necessarily a big farm of the alcohol industry or tobacco lobby that might kill the legal cannabis industry. It's the industry's own apathy that is more likely to be cause of an implosion. The success of the industry is in our hands, and we need to get a seat at the table in order to make change. You should because you're bringing in so much tax dollars, man. I'm just surprised the states aren't fighting for you either because uh, they're making a lot of money. Uh, Arizona recalls weed products over salmonella. Concerns and more pot, uh, and, and that's just crazy. Arizona third recall of cannabis products this summer. Salmonella, Montana investors challenge state law requiring cannabis owners to be residents. That's cool. Connecticut adult use sales reach a record high, pretty good, twenty three point six million. Massachusetts cannabis commissioner commission chair apologizes for saying the board is in crisis. Apologize for saying commissions was in crisis after the director, Sean Collins, resigned. That occurred on the same day the new record of $136 million for July cannabis sales was announced. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Just because someone that they liked or didn't like is leaving. <laughs> That's not crisis. <laughs> the people decide if they're buying cannabis or not. Uh, here's a huge one. Michigan cannabis sales rose 6.1% in July to a record of 276 276- Point seven million dollars. We all know Michigan is beautiful in the summer. It's beautiful mm-hmm. in the winter. It's beautiful in the fall, but really beautiful in the summer. And they get mobs of people that mm-hmm. come to Michigan to vacay, summer homes, whatever. I it doesn't doesn't. And there's almost seven hundred dispensaries in Michigan, so you can get fucking weed anywhere. And it's actually cheaper too in Michigan to get a lot of weed, so people could buy more. I could see those sales. Oh yeah, rising. They're yeah. Gonna, they're talking about. Michigan being a $3 billion market. Wow. Crazy. Uh, Some changes coming to Pennsylvania's medical uh, cannabis program. And uh, basically legalizing cannabis for medical purpose was considered a major milestone in Pennsylvania years ago. But the proposal will loosen regulations to allow doctors to prove all medical marijuana for any health conditions rather than just the ones allowed by law. So go, Pennsylvania. Do it. Get it done. This is uh, interesting. This article is talking about, and I've seen this on TV. I've seen this in multiple articles about this. Smoking marijuana increasingly seen as safer than cigarettes. American Metal Association Journal study finds. And I saw some people talking about this on the news today and um, saying, oh, it might not be true. We don't have enough information. We don't know enough yet to say that. I think we do, but we'll let Mrs. Weedman tell you about it. Yeah. Uh, People increasingly view smoking weed or being exposed to secondhand cannabis smoke as safer than smoking or being near tobacco smoke, according to a new study published by the American Medical Association. Researchers surveyed 5,035 U.S. adults three times in 2017, 2020, and 2021, about how they perceive the risks of both substances, and they found a significant shift over time as more people expressed that they felt cannabis smoke was generally safer than tobacco smoke. The survey, results of which were published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Substance Use and Addiction, on Friday, asked people whether they felt smoking one cannabis joint per day was much less safe, somewhat less safe, just as safe, somewhat safer or much safer than smoking one cigarette per day. Daily cannabis smoke or smoke exposure was perceived to be safer than tobacco, the authors wrote. And over time, views increasingly favored the safety of cannabis versus tobacco smoke. For example, in 2017, 
33.7% of respondents said that smoking cannabis once a day was either much more or somewhat more dangerous than smoking a daily cigarette, compared to 36.6% who said cannabis was safer and about 30% who said they were equal risks. In 2021, just 25.5% still believed cannabis was more dangerous, while 44% said weed was safer than cigarettes and 21% uh, increased from four years. Uh, that was a 21% increase from four years earlier. Similar trends were observed when respondents were asked about the relative dangers of being exposed to secondhand cannabis and cigarette smoke. In 2017, 29% of people said that secondhand cannabis smoke was more dangerous than cigarette smoke exposure, where 35% said the opposite was true, and another 35.6% said that neither was safer or more dangerous. And four years later, in 2021, 25.5% said that secondhand cannabis smoke was worse than tobacco, and 40% said that exposure to cannabis was safer than being around a cigarette. The survey also asked people to rate the relative safety of secondhand cannabis and tobacco smoke for different groups. For adults, 12.6% said cannabis was somewhat or completely safe versus the 2.4% who said the same about tobacco. For children, 4.8% said secondhand cannabis smoke was completely or somewhat safe compared to 1.8% for tobacco. And 5.3% said that exposure to cannabis smoke was generally safe for pregnant women, while 1.4% said that was true of cigarettes. U.S. adults have a more favorable view of the safety of primary and secondhand cannabis smoke exposure than tobacco smoke exposure, the paper says. Notably, the legality of cannabis in the participant's state of residence was not independently independently associated with change over time, the authors wrote. This suggests that the increasing perception of safety of cannabis may be a larger national trend rather than a trend seen only in states with legalization. The authors appear concerned about the change in attitude toward marijuana's relative safety, saying that public health efforts may be necessary to educate the public on potential risks and curb the increasing social acceptance of cannabis smoke exposure, similar to past education about secondhand tobacco smoke. The release of the new study comes days after Gallup came out with a new poll showing that half of Americans have tried weed. You just said that, Mr. Weedman, right? I and, did. Yeah, and more people now actively smoke cannabis than tobacco cigarettes. Additionally, a majority say they are not especially concerned about the effects of adults regularly using cannabis. Meanwhile, a poll released by the American Psychiatric Association in June found that Americans consider weed to be significantly less dangerous than cigarettes, alcohol, and opioids, and they say cannabis is less addictive than each of these substances, as well as technology. So dang. Crazy, right? Dang. 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 I don't know where that came from. I looked, I looked at the bowl. I think, dang, and you went, I need dang. to smoke. <laughs> I tell you what, I really enjoy smoking that GG4. That's good. I'm such a pig. Mm. I, I, I just am because I'm not giving any more of it up. It's for us, and maybe I'll, get, if people come over, I'll roll a joint and they could share, but I'm not giving any more nugs away of that beauty. It's too good. <laughs> it's too good. I know Big Earl has made some. Um, Basically, he's made uh, he, he's collaborated with the GG4 with some stuff, and yeah. he's made some different strains with the GG4 that he got. So I'm looking forward to trying some of these strains that mm -hmm. he's made with the GG4. So excited, <laughs> <laughs> big girl! I'm so excited when I see you at the end of the month. <laughs> <laughs> International news, German stage rally demanding legalization of cannabis. Uh, Chancellor uh, Cadman is due this week to discuss a draft bill that would allow the limited consumption of hashish and marijuana. The plans have been widely criticized as impossible uh, to police. Hundreds of people have joined the annual cannabis legalization protest in Germany, capital of Berlin, on Saturdays, day before the cabinet is due to discuss the draft of the law that will overturn the ban on, on cannabis. Police said five to six hundred people took part in the um, 
uh, the Hanif Parade, Hemp Parade. The numbers were, uh, however, about a third as last year's 1,500 participants. The parade started with the rally at the city's uh, Rhodes Radis Red Town Hall, and, prote- and, and the protest route included the Unter den Lin- Yuki, come here, read this to me. You're a German shepherd. <laughs> Help me out here, will you? Uh, hemp is great for peace and climate was the motto of this year's demonstration. The hemp parade has been held annually since 1997. The purpose is to call on the government to liberalize laws on on marijuana and hashish, which are derived from the cannabis plant. Um Germany set to ease the laws. The government is planning to legalize cannabis, potentially allowing dose to possess up to 25 grams of cannabis and grow a maximum of three plants. But under the the uh, the law now, uh, the 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 proposed law, cannabis could be cultivated and sold by so-called cannabis clubs, subject to strict rules, including the neutral packaging of a maximum of 50 grams per customer per month. This is making a lot of people upset in Germany. Because they kind of uh, changed what the laws were originally were going to be, uh, pro cannabis advocates within the coalition government are hoping to legalize cannabis this year. The health ministry thinks the measure could save the country's police, legal system, and prisons more than one point eleven billion dollars. Wow. Mm. Uh, Germany uh, police criticized the law earlier in the month. The deputy head of the German police union said the law would place a huge burden on police. No, it wouldn't. Um, So. And, uh, let's see if the bill passes and maybe they can move it forward and progressive to where they just do regular cultivation dispensaries. But Germany, you, you can grow three plants. Take that and at least run with it. Just keep on going. Turn and burn. Get autos. Get autos feminized. There's a, great, a lot of great breeders out there. Just start doing your own and grow your own medicine. Work with some people around you because they all got three plants. You can grow three plants in the state. Just do it. Man, forget about it. Um... Cannabis legalization bill introduced in Australia Parliament expected to generate $28 billion in nine years. The Green Senator of New South Wales, David Shoebridge, uh, Australia, presented the Greens legalizing cannabis bill in 2023 on Thursday, which will allow adults to use cannabis across the country, reported the National Tribune. This is the first bill introduced in the federal parliament that would regulate the legal marijuana market. The news comes some seven weeks after the Legalized Cannabis Party introduced a bill to legalize personal cannabis use in Victoria, New South Wales, and Western Australia's parliament all on the same day which is a sprinkling of political courage and collaboration mixed with a truckload of common sense. We can make this law and end the war on cannabis, Shoebridge said. It's time to stop pretending the consumption of this plant. Uh, stop pretending that consumption of this plant consumed each year by literally millions of Australians should still be seen as a crime. Everyone knows it's not a matter of if we legalize cannabis in Australia. It's a matter of when. And today we're talking, we're taking a huge step forward. Yes, I hope so. Our friend Tez, our friend Terp down there, man, and all the people that listen to us in Australia, you deserve freedom of cannabis and freedom to grow your plant and stopping the stigma and making sure that you you can grow your own medicine, caregiver programs, get it done and grow your own and grow for other people and make a living out of it. Uh, Canadian adult use cannabis sales uh, revel robust growth and it's outpacing the U.S. market now. Ooh. Mrs. Weed Man. Mr. Weed Man. Back when we were were getting married, would you have done a cannabis-themed wedding if it was legal back then? I don't know. I have no idea. Would you have even thought about it? I know you would have. Oh, you fuck yeah, I would have. <laughs> I, 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 actually, me and my best man went out and smoked weed after the wedding, so after we got married. So, <laughs> so. And I was carrying around a three-month-old baby, so I wasn't That's true. probably thinking all that much about That's true. weed. I don't even know if I drank at our wedding or our reception. I don't but, remember no, either. I don't think so. It was a nice wedding, though. It was beautiful. Just a beautiful 30-person sit-down dinner with a pianist. It's perfect. A p- pianist? <laughs> yeah, a piano yeah, player. Pianist. Pianist. Isn't that what they're called? A pin- pianist. <laughs> a pianist. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just having so a tell, moment over here. Tell us about this yeah. couple taking things higher yeah. with a cannabis-themed wedding. Yeah. Watching your wedding go up in smoke isn't necessarily a bad thing. With marijuana legalized in New York, Massachusetts, Maine, and a growing number of states, more couples are looking to take things higher. With cannabis-infused cocktails and pre-rolled joints available to wedding guests, people are starting to treat marijuana the same way they treat alcohol. 
said Sabrina Ellie, the Boston wedding planner behind Defined Lux Events, who has planned weddings that incorporate the newly legal plant. But right now, the law is really gray. You can have it, but it's not like getting a liquor license that tells you when, where, and how much. While weddings on cannabis farms that include everything from marijuana flower arrangements and bouquets to THC-infused dinners have been popular on the West Coast for several years now, New England is just starting to catch up. However, Ellie says the confusion about what is and isn't allowed makes many venues hesitate to host parties with pot. Organic farms and independent hotels or other venues run by owners who use marijuana themselves are good places to start your search. Connecticut couple John Philippides and Lakeisha Joseph decided after proposing at a cannabis expo that they would incorporate the crop into their I do's. We knew it would be more complicated, so a planner was our first priority, said Joseph, 28, who works as a talent manager in the entertainment industry. The couple plans to have a bud bar during a cannabis cocktail hour prior to their ceremony this October at a farm in Massachusetts. There will be weed-infused edibles as well as smokable flour. We had to be flexible, said Philippides, 31, who works as a television writer. We had to venture out a little ways and rearrange our budget a little bit. As they discovered, there are definitely some do's and don'ts when it comes to lighting up at your wedding. A wedding planner can vouch for you, said Ellie, who will be on site for Philippide and Joseph's wedding. You need to get everything in writing with a contract that includes cannabis. You need insurance just in case. I wouldn't do anything hush-hush. Creating a cannabis-only area that separates those who want to indulge can put operators at ease, hiring transportation to and from the venue, and hiring specialty cannabis caterers who are experienced with controlling dosage is also a must. Our basic package includes pre-rolls, or we can send someone to roll joints right in front of you, said Johnny Madden, the owner of Buddha Sam, which caters cannabis events in Brooklyn, Boston, and Connecticut. For a more upscale experience, spring for food and mocktails infused with cannabis butters and oils. Services like Madden's can bring credentialed gongiers to pair out your dinner while sharing information on the history, horticulture, aromas, flavor profiles, and effects of different types of weed. You are paying for a lot of knowledge, Madden said, whose services start at $50 per person. Something to consider, non-intoxicating CBD options, preferably in mocktails, said Madden. If someone's gone a bit too far or if they're inexperienced, CBD does tend to mellow the experience. If you are a couple that wants to go green without being stricken from your grandparents' will, there are diplomatic ways to make your wedding weed-friendly. I like gift bags, said Samantha Cantor, the cannabis-friendly caterer behind Dinner at Mary's. You can have joints or edibles for people to use in their personal time. I find that you really run the gamut with how people feel about cannabis, so it's nice to be subtle. But for couples like Philippides and Joseph, having cannabis at their wedding is also a statement. I don't think everyone in my family is happy about it, said Joseph. But they know I smoke, and I would say that there is an activism aspect to it for me because there are so many black people, in particular, incarcerated because of weed. It's not harmful. I don't think my family expected it to be incorporated in my wedding day, though. But yeah, it's going to happen. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. I love it. I love it. Ms. Weed Man. Mr. Weed Man. That's the end of the show. It is. You got anything else to say? Well, everybody, we're wrapping up the summer here in Chicagoland, and kids are going back to school. So if that's the case in your hood, drive safely. Watch out for those little ones running around. And if you got kids going back to school, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, I'm happy those days are behind me. <laughs> way behind you. Way behind you. Mrs. Weedman was a, was a stay-at-home mom for many years, and she uh, did an amazing job because I couldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. I'd be the first one to admit that. I'm not a good shopper. I don't know. I would just give the kids money and say, go shop yourself. <laughs> oh, for school supplies? <laughs> Everything. Everything. <laughs> I'm not a good shopper. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, stay safe out there, everybody, all you young rugrats out there going to school. Stay safe and all your parents out there. Watch out for kids while you're driving. And we love you out there. We really appreciate y'all out there listening, all the DMs, all the love, all just everything. We love you. Be kind to one another. That's Be happy. Right. What did I write down on your on your little book? Get living. 
something like that. Uh, get living today, or live for today. Live for today. Live for today. Can't live in the past. That's over. You don't know what the future's gonna entail. So just live for fucking today. Be present. Just be, be there. Now. Have be some now. fun. Smoke yeah. some weed. Big yeah. fat doinks, everybody. Live for today, and we love you out there. As Polly always says, smoke smart. Puff, puff, and away. Puff, puff, puff. Check out our cannabis lifestyle brand online at 8decades.com. Our custom smokes and accessories are perfect for your coffee table, bedroom nightstand, or kitchen counter. They're designed for you to show them off. The Canna community is also loving our hemp and cotton blend t-shirts, sweatshirts, scarves, and hats, finished off with our 8 Decades logo. We've got some awesome long-lasting goods that will be your favorite for years to come. 8 Decades, because a ninth decade of cannabis prohibition isn't acceptable. 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 Acceptable.